गुड मॉर्निंग व्यूअर्स एंड वेलकम बैक टू ट्रांस इंडिया रियल पीपल रियल इमोशंस दिस वीक वी हैव फॉर यू अ वेरी एनलाइटनिंग इंटरव्यू वी विल बी टॉकिंग टू मिस्टर गोपीनाथ रामाकृष्णन फॉन्डली नोन एज गोपी इन द ट्रांसपोर्ट इंडस्ट्री गोपी हैज बीन एन इंडिपेंडेंट कंसल्टेंट he has studied the road transport industry very closely especially the youngsters gopi has also been instrumental in initiating the mahindra empower program with iim amdabad which has shaped the future of many transport companies and also youngsters but before we get into this interaction let us take a look at a subject that has been troubling the road transport industry for quite some time now and that is diesel prices as we all know that diesel is a huge component in the operating cost of a truck as high as 60% in some cases but the government's fuel pricing policy is something that has been crippling the road transport industry and hurting not only large fleet owners but also small truckers let's take this very small example every state in india has a different price for diesel in fact the price difference in diesel in delhi and chennai is as vast as 5 rupees a liter now imagine the plight of a transporter or a trucker who is carrying goods from delhi to chennai the transporter not only has to optimize his route but at the same time he also has to see which state en route gives him a better price for diesel and he has to buy diesel accordingly well many transport companies already had that sorted in a way but then came another policy of the government revision of diesel prices on a daily basis how now does a transporter determine what would his freight be for a particular trip how does a transporter in this scenario fix his freight when he doesn't know what his operating cost is going to be diesel prices may change in the next 2 days or 3 days even before he completes a trip how does he fix his freight rate or calculate his basic operating cost many transport associations and we also have been after the government requesting them to change this policy our request has been that diesel prices should be revised at least once in 6 months or if not at least once in a quarter this gives the transporter a chance to calculate his exact operating cost the biggest worry for the government or the oil marketing companies has been that they are incurring losses and government is losing revenue but what the government can easily do is at the end of the quarter or the end of 6 months increase or decrease the prices depending on whether they are making a profit or the last 6 months or quarter has gone in a loss this should not be very difficult for the government because they are not losing any revenue the road transport industry stands to gain a lot from this we would like to remind the government once again and bring it to the notice that this policy or this method of fixing diesel prices will not end in a revenue loss for the government nor for the oil marketing companies it is just a matter of will that the government needs to take this call and change a policy which though may sound right from the oil companies perspective but it is a huge huge burden for the road transport industry friends it is very obvious that every time diesel prices go up the state governments are a happy lot because whenever the prices go up so does the collection of taxes on fuel this is because vat is levied on the price of diesel we would like to suggest to the government that instead of levying tax on the price of diesel tax should be levied on the quantity of diesel state government should be allowed to levy tax on a per liter basis as a result of this move every time the diesel prices are increased by the oil companies the impact on the consumer will be much lesser because the amount of vat would remain the same that would not change why is it that the state government should be allowed to make a windfall where on the other hand the transporters and truckers and even the common man is made to suffer this move may not take away the burden from the consumers but at least it will reduce the impact on the end consumer friends the third element of diesel pricing is uniformity of prices across india and this can be achieved only in two ways one is that the state governments align themselves and have a uniform rate of taxation on diesel or the second option is that diesel be brought under gst while the second option seems a tougher option i would urge the state governments to for once think of india as one country and see how much this move will benefit the transport industry as we mentioned earlier it is so difficult for the transporters to determine their operating cost as we mentioned earlier it is so difficult for a transporter to work out his costing 
when every state is selling diesel at a different price? And how can transporters compete with each other when some transporter is buying diesel that is 3 to 4 rupees cheaper than the other transporter? This is something that the government really needs to think about. Think about the transport industry also for a change. After the central government recently reduced the excise duty on fuel, some states also came forward and reduced the burden of taxes on the end consumer. But yet, there are some states who are still very happy collecting their taxes and have not provided any relief to the consumers, including the road transport industry. In a recent interaction with chief ministers, the Prime Minister Mr. Narendra Modi urged these states to come forward and play their bit and reduce the taxes. This is what the PM Mr. Narendra Modi had to say in his meeting with the chief ministers of various states. Listen into this bit. ऐसे संकट के समय में केंद्र और राज्यों के बीच तालमेल को कोऑपरेटिव फेडरलिज्म की भावना को और बढ़ाना अनिवार्य हो गया है अब मैं एक छोटा सा उदाहरण देता हूं जैसे पेट्रोल डीजल की कीमतों का एक विषय हम सबके सामने है देशवासियों पर पेट्रोल डीजल की बढ़ती कीमत का बोझ कम करने के लिए केंद्र सरकार ने एक्साइज ड्यूटी में कमी की थी पिछले नवंबर महीने में कम की थी केंद्र सरकार ने राज्यों से भी आग्रह किया था कि वो अपने यहां टैक्स कम करें और ये बेनिफिट नागरिकों को ट्रांसफर करें इसके बाद कुछ राज्यों ने तो भारत सरकार की इस भावना के अनुरूप यहां टैक्स कम कर दिया लेकिन कुछ राज्यों द्वारा अपने राज्य के लोगों को इसका कोई लाभ नहीं दिया गया इस वजह से पेट्रोल डीजल की कीमतें इन राज्यों में अब भी दूसरों के मुकाबले कहीं ज्यादा है ये एक तरह से इन राज्यों के लोगों के साथ अन्याय तो है ही साथ ही पड़ोसी राज्यों को भी नुकसान पहुंचाता है स्वाभाविक है कि जो राज्य टैक्स में कटौती करते हैं उन्हें राजस्व की हानि होती है जैसे अगर कर्नाटका ने टैक्स में कटौती नहीं की होती तो उसे इन छह महीनों में पांच हजार करोड़ रुपए से ज्यादा का राजस्व मिलता गुजरात ने भी टैक्स कम नहीं किया होता तो उसे भी साढ़े तीन चार हजार करोड़ रुपए से ज्यादा का राजस्व और मिलता लेकिन ऐसे कुछ राज्यों ने अपने नागरिकों की भलाई के लिए अपने नागरिकों की को तकलीफ न इसलिए अपने वेट में टैक्स में कमी की पॉजिटिव कदम उठाए वहीं गुजरात और कर्नाटक के पड़ोसी राज्य ने टैक्स में कमी न करके इन छह महीनों में साढ़े तीन हजार करोड़ रुपए से लेकर के पांच साढ़े पांच हजार करोड़ रुपए तक अतिरिक्त राजस्व कमा लिया जैसा हम जानते हैं कि पिछले साल नवंबर महीने में वैट कम करने की बात की थी सबको मैंने प्रार्थना की थी लेकिन कई राज्य मैं यहां किसी की आलोचना नहीं कर रहा हूं मैं सिर्फ आपसे प्रार्थना कर रहा हूं आपके राज्य के नागरिकों की भलाई के लिए प्रार्थना कर रहा हूं अब जैसे उस समय छह महीने पहले कुछ राज्यों ने बात को माना कुछ राज्यों ने नहीं माना अब कई राज्य जैसे महाराष्ट्र पश्चिम बंगाल तेलंगाना आंध्र प्रदेश तमिलनाडु केरला झारखंड किसी न किसी कारण से उन्होंने इस बात को नहीं माना और उनके राज्य को नागरिकों को बोझ कंटिन्यू रहा मैं इस बात में नहीं जाऊंगा कि इस दौरान इन राज्यों ने कितना रेवेन्यू कमाया लेकिन अब आपसे मेरी प्रार्थना है कि देश हित में आप पिछले नवंबर में जो करना था छह महीने डीले हो चुका है 
अब भी आप अपने राज्य के नागरिकों को वेट कम करके इसका बेनिफिट पहुंचाइए फ्रेंड्स इट इज वेरी क्लियर दैट देर इज अज गैप बिटवीन द थिंकिंग एंड द आइडियोलॉजी ऑफ द स्टेट्स फॉर द सेक ऑफ द रोड ट्रांसपोर्ट इंडस्ट्री एंड फॉर द लैक्स ऑफ ट्रकर्स एंड ट्रांसपोर्टर्स अक्रॉस इंडिया वी वुड अर्ज द गवर्नमेंट टू सिट अक्रॉस द टेबल एंड डिस्कस द फ्यूल पॉलिसी विच नीड्स सम चेंजेस चेंजेस दैट वुड नॉट ड्रास्टिकली इम्पैक्ट द रेवेन्यूज ऑफ द गवर्नमेंट बट इट वुड प्रोवाइड अ ह्यूज रिलीफ to the road transport industry we are not asking for discounts all we are asking for is these three things six monthly revision of fuel prices so that transporters can work out their operating costs second taxation on fuel on the basis of quantity and not the price and third finally to have uniform price of fuel across india let us be the one nation one tax that the government has been talking about why exclude something that impacts the road transport industry so deeply this government has been known for taking bold steps and we hope that this time they will take some steps for the road transport industry we would urge in fact we have been writing continuously to the pmo and to mr narendra modi requesting for some time to meet the road transport industry and discuss these issues at least hear out to what the industry has to say what its problems are we hope that the government will address these issues and meet the road transport industry well friends coming up after this very short break our exclusive interaction with mr gopinath ramakrishnan the founder and partner of vive consulting see you on the other side of this very short break you are watching trans india real people real emotions mahindra ye guarantee dete hain ki unka blazo x sabse zyada mileage deta hai warna kar dijiye truck wapas सॉरी अजय महिंद्रा फ्यूरियो है एक्शन महिंद्रा गारंटी देते हैं कि उनका फ्यूरियो सबसे ज्यादा माइलेज देता है नहीं तो एक्चुअली जयो महिंद्रा जयो है थोड़ा चेंज है एंड एक्शन महिंद्रा ये गारंटी देते हैं कि उनका जयो सबसे चल क्या रहा है यहाँ पे मैम ये चारों ट्रक ज्यादा माइलेज देते हैं चारो तो ऐसा बोलो ना ब्लेजो एक्स फ्यूरियो फ्यूरियो सेवन और जयो महिंद्रा के ये सभी ट्रक्स देते हैं सबसे ज्यादा माइलेज की गारंटी नहीं तो कर दीजिए इन्हें वापस महिंद्रा देश की सबसे ज्यादा माइलेज देने वाली ट्रक रेंज वेलकम बैक फ्रेंड्स आई एम गिरीश मीचंदानी एंड यू आर वॉचिंग ट्रांस इंडिया रियल पीपल रियल इमोशंस टूडे वी आर इंटरक्टिंग विद अ मैन हु इज नॉट जस्ट अ कंसल्टेंट टू द रोड ट्रांसपोर्ट इंडस्ट्री ही इज लाइक अ फ्रेंड फिलोसोफर एंड गाइड टू मेनी ट्रांसपोर्टर्स स्पेशली द यंगस्टर्स हु लुक अप टू हिम फॉर एडवाइस एवरी नाउ एंड देन सो लेट्स यूर इट फ्रॉम गोपी ऑन वॉट ही हैज टू से अबाउट द रोड ट्रांसपोर्ट इंडस्ट्री हिज जर्नी एंड वॉट द फ्यूचर होल्ड्स फॉर दिस वेरी वास्ट इंडस्ट्री Welcome to Trans India Gopi. For starters, tell us your deep connection with this road transport industry since you are neither a transporter nor an OEM but you understand this industry better than many others who've been here for decades. So I've been a business consultant since the late 90s and um, uh, one of the very interesting assignments we did um, in about 1999 was to work on strategy for a large automotive company. um and as part of the strategy we actually evolved the concept of transport solutions uh, for them um and uh, essentially the idea was that in order to protect their business in the face of the foreign onslaught which at that time was still on the way companies like toyota and hyundai were just setting up shop the question that they asked is was how do we as a small indian player uh, be competitive and thrive in the face of global competition and one of the strategies that we evolved for them was to move into the transport services because we said that you you are making vehicles which are used by your customers as transporters if you are able to get them business if you are able to harness the network of your customers and get them business from others then you will be able to protect yourself from the 
on sort of competition. And that actually was the birth of what is today known as Mahindra Logistics. Because the company was Mahindra and Mahindra or the automotive sector. And we helped them formulate what at that time was called a transport solution strategy. Uh, they actually formed a group called Transport Solutions Group, uh, which took it forward and then we, which eventually became a separate company called Mahindra Logistics. So my uh, association with the road transport and logistics in India started then. Um, and uh, subsequently went on to um, assignments around the world because I was working with Satyam and the consulting arm and I was uh, responsible in part for the supply chain practice uh, of Satyam. Uh, the supply chain consulting practice of course spans the entire supply chain so we had to look at things like warehousing, distribution and of course transportation as well. Uh, so we ended up doing projects for uh, companies like General Motors. For example, I looked at their supply chain operation strategy uh, globally, looked at the processes and systems that they were using to support the supply chain operations across the world, uh, things like that. So did done a fair amount of work with uh, uh, companies like British Petroleum, for example. We looked at their order to cash process. And uh, by the way, I also was uh, running the Six Sigma consulting practice at that time. So BP was big, big into Six Sigma and they wanted us to uh, bring in an approach oriented on Six Sigma on how to improve the uh, order to cash process uh, for Castrol, which they had acquired at that time. So they wanted to kind of amalgamate the processes across Europe. So we had teams from, I think, uh, Britain, Austria, Germany, Luxembourg, a uh, couple of others who used to meet uh, in the UK and figure out how to put a kind of a common global process across. So I've been working with uh, on assignments like that. And then um, um, kind of moving forward, um, you know, I think from early 2000, uh, 2000, actually mid, mid 2000, 2005 or so, that started getting more involved in the logistics industry in India again. After the initial years of kind of building the Mahindra Logistics or uh, the Transport Solutions practice, um, got involved again with a few companies here, essentially looking at how could they optimize their transport operations. So it was really looking at business processes, looking at the way that, you know, the entire planning was done uh, to see how can we optimize things. So, Kobi, how do you typically see the road transport industry? This is really where the initial question which came into my mind of what is it is the value that transport companies are offering? Because the more you examined this whole system, it became apparent that it was being driven entirely by the end consumer, by the end customer. Right. So, it is the customer, the shipper. Uh, whether it's uh, Hindustan Lever or Castrol or whoever it may be, they are the ones who are calling the shots. They were dictating terms in terms of what needs to be moved, when does it need to be moved, how does it be, need to be moved, uh, you know, what quantities, uh, what timelines and what cost. So everything is being actually driven by the customer and therefore the transporter is nothing but uh, the entity who is following the instructions of the uh, customer and therefore does has very little say in the entire operations other than to actually execute. In fact, when we started working with uh, Mahindra truck and bus uh, at some point and they were very keen to see how to make the whole industry more professional, uh, this was one of the challenges that we had to kind of mm -hmm. uh, overcome. You know, because this question is what is it that makes an industry more professional? One of it is obviously taking decisions about your own industry. Gobi, this industry is always known to be unorganized and it has been working without any uh, policies that could bind the industry together, create some guidelines. How do you see the structure of the road transport industry? Yeah, you're absolutely right, Girish. See, the industry has grown very organically in India in the sense that people who had started with one truck, maybe even a small vehicle and then graduated to a larger vehicle, um, were the ones who were the initial founders of the industry, you can say. And then, of course, the next generations came in and they expanded. So typically, a person has one vehicle, then he gets a second or third one and then, you know, brings in his relatives, his, his uh, brother or cousin or nephew or son, and then the business has grown. So if you see today, a lot of the people are in the la larger companies are the perhaps the third generation uh, who are running the company. And the first generation, uh, you know, who was very entrepreneurial, uh, did not have any formal education in most for the for most of them. Um, maybe the second generation did have a little bit, you know, schooling, college, etc., but not any management education. So all the tricks of the trade they learned was from 
actually their father or grandfather and in actually running the business. So there was a lot of common sense which was being applied. There was no formal uh, education or knowledge which they had, which they could use. So whether it's in terms of you know human resource management, in terms of financial management, uh, in terms of marketing strategies, they really went by what they knew and what they could think of. Their traditional business sense which came to the fore as opposed to acquired business knowledge. So these were just jargons for them? These were jargons for them and, and so, so naturally like anybody else when you hear terms which are being spouted by others which you don't understand you tend to dismiss it as okay. jargon. It's, it's true for all of us. If somebody comes in and talks very fancily uh, about any topic then we say you are uh, enough. You know I know the business. I am there with my feet on the street. Uh, don't give me all these airy fairy ideas. It's very natural. But at the same time there is a need for a person who has not gone through the grind the way the grandfather did or the father did when he started, um, the next generation who is coming in, they have not gone through that mill of starting with one truck and building it up. So they have really not learned the business the hard way. They have they've come in when the business is at a certain level and they need to take it to the next level. So for them, you know, having the tools of management is very essential because that helps them contribute their bit to what Papa and you know, right. uh, Grandpa have actually. Uh, built. Could be the road transport industry, despite its importance, always finds itself in troubled waters. What do you think are the essential changes that are required to make this industry better or how can this industry evolve itself? Okay, uh, that's, a, that's a very, very open-ended question. There are a lot of things we need to look at. So one is to look at the paradigm of the industry, right? As we just discussed, the industry has been built upon the customer telling the players what was to be done and the transporter executing it by providing the right vehicle at the right time making sure it reaches the destination right. damage is less within cost driver is you know uh, passing on the right information at the uh, to them as to where they are etc all of that they're just managing the entire chain of events <clears throat> now any industry as it grows uh, tends to do a couple of things one is it tends to learn how to be more efficient by being able to manage its own processes better. So it's able to save cost, save time, etc. The second that it does is it starts to differentiate by adding value. The businesses who are leading there uh, in that industry tend to be able to do more. So they, instead of saying that you tell me what you want delivered and then your parameters of you know on time, within cost and low damage, etc. That's the only parameters I'll go by. Um, the, the players will start saying, let me do a little bit more for you to solve your problems. You take, for example, the software industry, which is much younger than the transport business. Right? Initially, what we had was you know, a bunch of small software firms which used to do body shopping. Right? All they used to do was provide people to the uh, global market. This, you, even a TCS or an Infosys, all they did was send people abroad. Then they evolved to saying that we will do projects for you. Don't just ask me for 10 people. But I'll actually put in a project manager, I'll put in a systems architect, whatever, and I will do the entire project. Then they evolved to the next level saying that, listen, doing the entire project usually means doing it at your location, which is expensive. Why don't I do it back home in India in a hybrid way, which is some people here, some people there, etc. So they evolved a different model and told the customer, I'm adding value to you by doing the end result is the same. The end result is the software you want, but the process is different. And the benefits are different because you're saving time, cost, etc. And the process is entirely different. So now the, the, the question is in the transport industry, are the players evolving new models? Are they trying to tell the customer, I will do what you want, but I will do it differently. And therefore you will get benefits and I will get benefits. So this is what we are seeing happening in pockets. There are some people, for example, who may be some players who may be saying that instead of sending 10 trucks, uh, every week to this from point A to point B. Um, why don't we send five larger trucks and I will store the material for you in point B and, and deliver to your factory or to your distributor as and when you want. So I will be a, you know, a, a intermediate stocking point for you, which will optimize the flow of goods because you know, sending, sending 10 medium sized vehicles, let's say 10 ICVs, let's send six HCVs and I will stock the goods for you. Things like that which are innovations which the customer would appreciate because his need is to receive a certain number of units of the product at a particular time. 
for which he had initially given the uh, requirement of send 10 ICVs every week. Now the same uh, end result is happening, but the process is a little different. You're sending more in a larger vehicle, which means it optimizes the cost of transport. And the guy says that let me hold and hold it for you, which means I'm storing it. I'm adding warehousing to my services. But for you, the end result is the same at a lower cost. So these are, these are kinds of innovation that some transporters are coming up with. And we need to see a lot more of that because that will take the industry to the next level. So what is required for this to happen is one, you need to break out of this mindset that my job is to do what my customer asks me to do. And that's where it ends. You have to get into the mindset that my job is to provide value to the customer. And the more value I can provide, what happens? One, the customer is happier. Therefore, I retain him or I get more business. Two, I share part of the value. So my profit can go up because if I'm able to save the customer two rupees, then I can pocket one rupee out of that, right? So I can get more money. The third is that it differentiates me from my competition because it's not easy to replace me now. If, I've, if I'm providing more services than what somebody else is doing, it becomes more difficult to replace. Mahindra ye guarantee dete hain ki unka Blazo X sabse zyada mileage deta hai varna kar dijiye truck Cut. wapas Sorry Ajay Mahindra Furio hai action Mahindra guarantee dete hain ki unka Furio sabse zyada mileage deta hai nahi to actually Jayo Mahindra Jayo hai thoda change hai and action Mahindra ye guarantee dete hain ki unka Jayo sabse chal kya raha hai yahan pe Ma'am ye charo truck zyada mileage dete hain charo तो ऐसा बोलो ना ब्लेजो एक्स फ्यूरियो फ्यूरियो सेवन और जयो महिंद्रा के ये सभी ट्रक्स देते हैं सबसे ज्यादा माइलेज की गारंटी नहीं तो कर दीजिए इन्हें वापस महिंद्रा देश की सबसे ज्यादा माइलेज देने वाली ट्रक रेंज कुड बी फ्रॉम द टाइम यू हेल्प स्टार्ट महिंद्रा लॉजिस्टिक्स एंड टू डेट वॉट आर दी डिफ्रेंशिएटर्स डेट यू सी इन द इंडस्ट्री स्पेशली uh the role of the youngsters well a lot of things i think first of all the industry as such you know one is from the uh, oem point of view the kind of products you have the vehicles you have uh, are so much uh you know technologically advanced so um one is of course the entire you know technology has changed the kind of vehicles the range all that has changed specialized vehicles coming in so it's a, a lot of lot of the work that earlier had to be done by the transporter in terms of adapting a particular vehicle for use for certain cargo now is kind of done by the OEM they're providing the solutions so it becomes a little easier um, the second is of course that you've seen a drastic change in the competition the uh, the emergence of the new age transport companies who don't want to be called transport companies by the way they prefer to be called technology companies or enablers or whatever so whether it's a rivigo or a black buck or whoever it is or you know for in city movement companies like porter and so on has completely changed the landscape because suddenly you've got professionals coming in into a domain which was traditionally handled by family businesses right so the mindset the thinking the background everything is very different but when you look at the traditional transport companies and now you've got the third gen coming in in some cases even the fourth gen uh, coming in obviously these are youngsters who have come in some of them came in earlier because it was the family business you had no choice you had to be there and doesn't matter what you do so go and study something for a couple of years go abroad uh, you know have your fun and then come back and settle down in the grind but some of these guys have had a different mindset they've said that okay this is the family business but you know what it's an opportunity for me to build something new for, for me to do something different and they've brought back some of the skills that they have acquired for example people have gone and done some course in uh, management information systems or using some you know data in some way it they've they try to come back and build uh, the you know that into those skills into the company by being a bit more analytical by having more it in the picture and so on and the um, emergence of courses like the one that we helped uh, Mahindra put together for along with IIM Ahmedabad, uh, the, the Empower program, uh, definitely added to that. You know, uh, the, being able to skill the youngsters and get them thinking in the right direction. And after that, it's not credit to the course or the people behind it. It's credit to these youngsters who were able to unleash their own power of creativity, imagination and uh, process. Uh, to be able to take things forward. So there's been a huge difference from those days 
uh, I'm talking about in the late 90s uh, when it was very much, you know, everything was offline. There was no data. The vehicles were not really the best suited. Today you see, you know, top of the line vehicles. You see everything is integrated. Information is flowing in and you have people with the mindset to make a difference. Gobi, do you think that this industry is better organized today than it was back in time? And how relevant is the fact that there are hardly any entry barriers for this industry? Anybody is free to just walk in? See, I think all this is happening in pockets. These are all, all this is happening, I would say, in one sense. It's what I would call in the fringes. Because if you take the industry as such, if you take the... Uh, the large chunk of this industry is unfortunately still one, two, three vehicle owners. While the, um, you know, the organized players are perhaps well known, um, they still constitute a very small percentage of the industry. And even amongst the organized players, you see many of them still operating in a traditional way. The, the challenge is going to be, how do you get the either the organized players have to change more drastically than they are changing today or they have to see some kind of a amalgamation happening in the industry where you have fewer players. Okay. The industry is such that it's got a long tail, right? If and, and again, I come back to comparisons with the IT industry because they're so similar despite serving completely different needs. If you take the Indian software industry, it's also got a very long tail, right? You walk around any street in Delhi or Bombay or Chennai and you will see some software companies board name board up in front of an apartment or in front of a small commercial building. Similar to transporters. Everybody is a transporter because, see, one of the important things here is what is the cost of entry? What are the barriers to entry? Today, I can be a transporter if I can afford to pay the down payment on a used truck. I don't need to buy a new truck. So uh, if I want to get, if I, if I can pay 50,000 rupees and secure the ownership of a used, you know, a 10 year old truck, I'm a transport. Of course, you can also say that I, I don't need to own a vehicle to be a transporter. If I can have a bill book, if I can afford a bill book, I can take on load. That's, you know, actually true. But if I want to be a transporter or a fleet owner or a truck owner in the true sense, all I need to do is that. There is nothing else which stops me. Similar to being uh, running a software company, what do you need? You need a computer and a name board and you're in business. So when there's a very, very low barrier to entry, it seems very tempting for people to enter. But then once you enter, you need to know how to run the business, which is not very easy. You, then you need to know how to grow the business, right? But when you, also the, for the established person, the fact that there's a low barrier to entry means that there's a low barrier for competition. So anybody can come in and quote one rupee less. And obviously if I come in with my first purchase of a vehicle, I'm eager to get business. So if somebody is quoting 20,000 rupees for a particular route, I'm happy to quote 18,000 rupees or 16,000. Partly because I don't know what the true costs are. Yes. I'm ill-informed. And partly because I want to make uh, an entry. I want to get some business, right? So I don't mind operating at a loss initially. Hmm. So then how does the established guy, and I'm talking about as if I'm a one vehicle uh, firm, I'm competing with somebody who's got five vehicles, right? So I'm not even talking about the biggies. So how do I you know, make sure that I get entry, I quote less. What does the guy with five vehicles have to do in order to safeguard his business? What can he do? Quote lesser. He has to quote lesser? Absolutely. So that then becomes a vicious cycle. Then everybody keeps going down till the point that you're quoting absurd uh, amounts, you know, <laughs> right? So that doesn't work clearly. That's not going to work. That's not sustainable, right? So what else can he do? So he will either look for some other business from somebody else. He'll say that this customer is you know, too cost conscious, let me go to the next customer, let me rate the business of the 10 vehicle owner or the 20 vehicle owner, right? Or he can, if he is smart, he can say, let me bring you in as a partner, right? Okay, I've got five vehicles, you know what, I was going to buy a sixth vehicle, but I won't buy it. You got one vehicle now, so you come and work with me, which is happening a lot, you know, formally and informally in the country. But still, it doesn't change the basic dynamics that this is a very, very cost competitive uh, industry. Anybody can enter and anybody can pull down the price. 
what the five vehicle owner or the 10 vehicle owner needs to do is to see what can I do to add value to the customer, Absolutely. which this uh, one vehicle guy cannot do, Correct. right? Unfortunately, that thinking is not there. And as you go up the value chain from five vehicles to 50 vehicles to 100 to 500, we still don't see that kind of thinking coming in, except like I said, in pockets. There are a few people who are actually saying that, let me not do business in this region meaning geographic region or a particular industry or a particular route uh, because it's not profitable. But let me do something else where I can add more value. But that's unfortunately only in very, very small pockets. Gopi, how can the industry align itself for a better future? And how important is the role of transport associations in shaping this future? Also, do you think that knowledge sharing and enhancement is something that the industry should be looking at very closely? I think that's where the role of some of the associations comes in. See, today, unfortunately, in the transport uh, industry, when you talk about association, you're only related to politics. You're related to votes, you're related to power, etc. Of course, in recent times, in COVID times, the associations have done a wonderful job in terms of taking care of drivers, taking care of, uh, you know, all the stakeholders from a humanitarian perspective. So, and hats off to all of them for that. They've done a wonderful job. But if you look at it from a business perspective, See, an association of uh, companies in a particular industry is meant to improve the industry. It's meant to, of course, fight for the rights, lobby with the government, uh, all stakeholders and all that, but also has a responsibility to elevate the industry. You take the uh, automotive industry, you have uh, the Society of Indian Automotive Manufacturers. While they are lobbying for, you know, various taxation related or regulation related things, they also exchange a lot of information on technology. So what Siam does is exchange information on trends and technology, whether it's about BS6 or whether it's about electric vehicles, etc. What are they doing through that? They're enhancing the knowledge level of the entire industry. Obviously, they're doing it with competitors. They're collaborating with them. They're sharing information with them. They're taking it to the next level. What did NASCOM, the Indian IT Industry Association do? They encouraged smaller players. They in fact kind of co-opted the entire BPO industry, which was very, very nascent at the time the software industry was taking off. BPO was kind of the poor cousin of uh, IT, right? But they said, don't form your own association, be part of us. Mm -hmm. And they, uh, they taught the BPO industry a lot of things. How to go acquire more customers, how to be present in an on-site offshore mode you know kind of they kind of groomed them a little bit and of course all the IT players also started their own BPO that's a you know part of the story but the point is that the industry has to take care of its own it has to take care not only from a a point of view of regulation of uh, you know um, taxes and so on but also from a knowledge enhancement point of view and that's where we see there's a huge gap. No matter how much you have efforts by, let's say, a CII or an Automotive Skill Council or, or even a Mahindra bringing in these things, uh, the kind of the essential education gap, the knowledge gap, it's still not sufficient because you can address 5, 10, 50,000, 50,000 people, not the lakhs of transporters who are there. That is something has to be done at the industry level, uh, across, you know, national level, state level and so on. Do you feel that for starters, the industry or the associations should come together and start working on policies that would regulate the business and also shape the future at the same time? Uh, good point. See, um, <clears throat> putting policies down is, a, in my view, is a matter of words, right? It's about the intent behind the policies because we can come together and draft a wonderful document, we can say a lot of nice things about what we intend to do and so on. I think what matters is, are you instituting the building blocks to getting there? For example, we can say that we want to make sure that there is, um, let's take something basic, proper driving habits for drivers. That's a very laudable thing, we would say accident, safety, etc. that all our drivers should uh, be able to, uh, you know, they should be aware of the good and safe driving habits. Now, how are you implementing that? Is there a way to implement it? So when you write a policy, you should also say, how am I going to implement? Absolutely. 
very often we find at at any level you know the united nations will declare something as a policy and there are really no steps to implement it the same thing holds good for so many different uh, uh, global organizations uh, indian organizations and so on it, it, it is all a nice matter of statement of intent but when it when it comes to you know an uh, industry a body that wants to make things happen genuinely they should first introspect about how do i do it start small don't have very very ambitious goals put together three goals for the year which you think you can make a difference in where you can show that there is a progress which means it's measurable then you have then it's doable that means you have a mechanism to do it and then when you go and implement it you will be able to show people that see we wanted to work on these three things we were at this level certain level 2 on 10 4 on 10 5 on 10 in these things and now we have gone up to that 2 has gone to 4 that 4 has gone to 6 and that 5 has gone to 8 mm -hmm. we been able to progress obviously you want to go beyond 10 you want to go to 20 and to 100 but at least we have started, started and we have a way to do it we have a way to measure it and show us and show everybody how it's been done well friends that was part one of our interaction with gopi next week we will continue this very interesting interaction and know more about the role of youth in the future of the road transport industry and how the iim program has helped groom these youth stay tuned it's goodbye from us and before you go don't forget to subscribe to our channel until next week stay safe jai hind